I don't know if you have taken a great risk because you have invited a physicist to a politics seminar. <laughs> so, um, physicists, physicists, you have to know, are simple-minded people. They always take the simplest kind of experimental settings, then they write down some equations, and then they hope that comes out what they have calculated. Now, obviously, politics is not as easy as that because there are many variables, many things that go can go wrong or can go otherwise. And so it's a very complicated field, and I feel honored to be among you. Um, just let me mention these two books, uh, God and the Erklärung der Welt, God and the Explanation of the World, which might be interesting for some of you, especially those, of course, who can read German. Um, <clears throat> and the thesis of this book is that um, the Christian faith is a better explanation or gives a better explanation of the world than atheism. And if you cannot read German, in this small leaflet you have, there is a homepage given and there are also English language resources. And the second one refers very much to what I've been telling you today, uh, the Free Society. Um, and also there is a homepage uh, referring to the Professoren Forum and there are also English language resources, so uh, videos and um, articles and so on. So I hope that can serve uh, anybody. So the question I was asked to answer is uh, free or fragmented, can we overcome a polarized society? So that's what I'm going to talk now, free or fragmented, and can we overcome a polarized society? I will do that in four points. Um, I'll describe the fragmentation of a free society, then uh, the silent social transformation and the role of Christians they can play in this game are Christians. Christians are friends of freedom and unity, at least they should be. And then, of course, coming back to the question, can we overcome a polarized society? So the first part um, covers four topics, worldviews and ideologies. And... Um, physicists like definitions. Here is an attempt. So what is a worldview? Worldviews are a collection of values, views or concepts uh, that explain the world or part of it, the society, the role of the individual, meaning of life. Not all worldviews do that. And uh, some worldviews also talk about views on transcendence. And there are ideologies. And ideologies are somewhat different. And I take a very um, uh, general definitions, and my definitions of ideologies are ideologies are ideas and worldviews that are not based on evidence or need not to be based on evidence and good arguments, but that essentially aim to stabilize or change. So while worldviews should be interested in how the world is and what we can make of it, Ideologies are not so much interested in how the world is, but more on how the world should be and what power I have to exert to, uh, to, to transform uh, the world or society to what it should be in my ideological mind. So this is uh, important to keep in mind. So um, one of the most influential ideologies comes from Karl Marx. And Karl Marx has very creative grandchildren and grand-grandchildren. So if we look at the most deadly ideology of the 20th century, then it's clearly communism. It's the most, not only the most deadly, but also the most deceptive ideology, because other ideologies are easier to dismantle, like fascism or so. Everybody sees that is uh, not a good way to go. But communism is quite deceptive. On, on the other hand, it has cost uh, at least 150 million victims by democide. And democide means killing of people not in military actions, but killing people who are not armed or cannot uh, somehow respond to that. What holds for all ideologies is that power kills, and absolute power kills absolute. This is this uh, very short summary of Rudolf Rommel, uh, a scientist, a politician, uh, a politician uh, uh, of science, um, who uh, devoted his life on the question of democide, of the violence that 
uh, governments uh, do to their populations. And he wrote a book, or one of his books is Death by Government, and there you can have all these numbers which are collected very diligently there. So and if we look at the top of the iceberg, the multi-deca mega murderers, which means those are people who killed many more than 10 million people, 20 million, 30 million, 60 million people. There are three names, which is Hitler, Stalin, and Mao. And you can debate about the, the uh, order. Um, but it's quite clear that uh, these ideologies have killed huge amount of people, not only in military conflicts, but also in, um, in, in concentration camps and so on and so on. Now, as we, uh, as we have seen what is going on in Ukraine, uh, the question is, will Putin join the list of shame? I hope not, because that would have disastrous consequences for us all. But uh, still, um, what uh, Rommel says is uh, to be taken serious. The more power someone has, the more power a government has, the more dangerous it is. So, and that is fully in accord with the Bible. Uh, in Matthew 20, we find uh, the statement of Jesus. You know about the rulers of the nations. They hold power over their people. Their high officials order them around. Don't be like that. Instead, anyone who wants to be important among you must be your servant. And we have to remember the underlying power that causes all these killings and deaths. And in John 8, uh, Jesus tells us, he, the devil, was a murderer from the beginning. And we have to take that serious, this statement. We'll come to, to uh, this statement later on again. So when we talk about Karl Marx and his creative grandchildren, we might ask, what is left? Is there a definition? This is a very broad sort of, of scope of attitudes and ideologies. And um, I found the definition or the attempt of a definition from Roger Scruton very helpful. He has written a book that is called Fools, Frauds, and Firebrands. It's worthwhile reading. Um, and he says, the basic idea of left thinking is that goods of this world are unjustly distributed and that the fault for this lies not in human nature, but in the wrongful possession practiced by a dominant class. Now, already this statement, if it's correct, is a mixture of truths and lies. Because yes, there are goods that are unjustly distributed. But no, there is a fault in the human nature. The human nature is the problem, and it is denied by communism that the, uh, that the uh, human nature is the problem. So we very often find statements that mix up true and false uh, statements, and they are mingled together. And so the question is, how do you create, in this view, a just world? And um, there are different answers. There's a classical Marxism. There is a neo-Marxism, which is associated to the Frankfurt School. Someone, several of you might know that. Then there is a post-Marxist left, and there is then a quasi-religious uh, woke culture, which we, could, uh, which we can see today. So the classical Marxism says um, the history is governed by the struggle for the means of production and violent revolution up to this uh, dictatorship of the proletariat. This is a classical Marx description. And uh, neo-Marxism took another way. And they said, we have to change the culture to bring about a revolution. Marx didn't bother so much about the culture. He did, but not so much as a neo-Marxist. And they said, if we can church, if we can change the culture, we can bring about a revolution. That must not necessarily be a, uh, a bloody revolution, as in the case of classical Marxism, but it is still a revolution. And then came the post-Marxist left, and they concentrated on actually or supposedly suppressed minorities. So uh, which group is good for revolution? Migrants, women, queer people, or whatever. And it's not to say that there are no uh, suppressions or discriminations, but it's uh, it doesn't really matter if this is an actual or supposed suppression. It is only the question, are certain groups relevant for a revolution? 
And now we have, as I would see it today, we have come to a quasi religious culture, which is sometimes called woke. And um, that depends on the purification of consciousness through moral superiority. So what is going on here? We have, as I would term it, a class struggle 2.0. The old class struggle 1.0 is liberation of the oppressed working class through revolution. And the creation of a revolutionary consciousness of the working class works through the party, through the political party, through the communist party or whatever party there is. But the problem is, there's a problem with the working class today. The working class has a row house and Mercedes and is on vacation on Mallorca. It's not really suitable for a revolution. So they have to look for other ways. And that's what I termed class struggle 2.0 use many actually or supposedly oppressed minority, minorities, women, which are not even a minority, low wage earners, unemployed refugees, LBTQ, what you can name whatever you, you want. And again, it's not important whether there is an actual or a supposed, uh, a supposed oppression. The question is, is this special group suitable to make a contribution to a social revolution? So the task of left Politics is to make the oppressed aware of their oppression and use alleged or actual injustice for revolution. That's the concept. So, and how can you, can you make this concept operative? And one of the uh, big terms that is used to make this uh, concept operative is the question of justice. So, social justice. Everybody talks about social justice, but it's an ill-defined term. Why? Because no one knows when social justice is achieved. We know when social injustice is achieved or when social injustice is existing, but nobody can say, now we have social justice. So it's a term that is never, a goal that is never met. Distributive justice, when are goods or money or so equally distributed or just distributed? Gender justice, when is gender justice achieved? When is climate justice achieved? When is vaccination justice achieved? So you can take every term and put justice behind it and you get a moral uh, expression. When do we have equal representation? Um, you can add a couple of other terms. So every aspect of life becomes a matter of justice and the easiest way to come to justice is equality. So 50-50 distributions. So as this is sort of uh, um, conducive, so uh, it is, people would like, oh yeah, we want, of course we want justice. And okay, if we want justice, we have to have equality. Um, so this, this is a moral sort of goal. So uh, yeah, of course we want a higher moral standard. And so this ideology becomes common sense without people noticing it. So um, maybe stressing the last part a little bit, identity politics, wokeness, and cancel culture. What is identity politics? It basically also works with replacing arguments by emotions. Identity politics is the uh, idea that your, your identity is defined by your belonging to a minority. So minorities are victims per definition, and victims have to, be, have to demand compensation. And on the other hand, there is the majority society, and the, for the majority society, there is a purification agenda. So the majority must repent for their privileges. And they can do this by providing support to victims, financially or ideally, or by purification through repentance the acknowledge of their own wrongful status. So this drives a division into society. The victims are kept passive and the guilty majority feels unfair treated. So there is no end in sight. There is no point where you say, oh, now it's completely fair and now everything uh, has been removed and everything is fine. There is just no point like this. There is more and more structural discrimination to be found 
And that requires re regulation, that requires government regulation, that requires quota or even positive discrimination. So the term positive discrimination says, okay, if there was a negative discrimination, now we have to have a positive discrimination to get things right. But discrimination in the end is discrimination. And so there's a division of a society that is driven further and further. Now, what is wokeness, uh, a very diffuse sort of expression? I would say it's belonging to the intellectual moral er elite, belonging to the right side. We know what is right. And when we know what is right, we can enforce what is right and try to bring people to the right mindset. And what they do is seeding fear. And um, you may have heard about these people who say, we are the last generation. And I think that's a total abuse of the climate crisis. Because whatever happens, we will not be the last generation. Life on Earth may change, and there may be changes of whatever kind. But we are certainly not dying out as humankind. So there is a, a huge fear put in the heart of people with uh, a statement that is definitely wrong. And um, then cancel culture is applied. Everything that does not fit into this ideology is cleansed. There's a historical cleansing. Uh, there's a cleansing by decolonialization, by anti-racism, anti-fascism, and so on, and so on, and so on. This expression basically serves to get rid of everything that is unwanted in this ideology. And there's a pseudo-tolerance going on. So there's freedom only in conformity with ideology. And there is a denial of truth. And at the same time, there is the insistence of truth, the insistence of woke truth. Our statements are correct. We know what we are doing. We are right. And on the other hand, no, there is no absolute truth. And that coexists. And that is difficult for some people to grasp. So the ideology overrules logic. One example that is discussed nowadays is there is a pressing for human right to abortion. And if you, if you think about it, there is a human right to kill another human. So what is about the human right of this one? So it's, it's disastrous. It's a ruin of reasoning. It just doesn't work in itself, no matter what you think about the general situation, but this doesn't work in itself. And um, what comes out of that is what I would call a gospel of guilt. So there is an ideological moral guilt complex. If you are European, especially German, Christian, white, heterosexual, male, you are just guilty. But there is atonement. That's a good message. So showing the correct attitude, the appropriate language as a gesture of submission. In English, this is easier. In German, it's very, getting very complicated, uh, very complicated using large uh, letters in the middle of the, of the word or, or uh, whatever kind of asterisk or so to show you, uh, you, are, um, you have the correct attitude. You know what's important. And you surrender to the claim of justice that is morally necessary. So there, if you follow this attitude, then politics, political decisions come without alternatives. But because the alternative would be immoral. Nobody can be for the immoral, so you have to follow the main line. But the problem is, there is never enough. The spiral just keeps on spinning. There's indulgence, but there is, uh, there is indulgence trade, but no indulgence. It ha doesn't, have, doesn't have an end. So people kept in this circle of guilt. It's a gospel of guilt. It uh, breeds oppression, fear, and activism. But it does not create a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells, as Peter says. So. Um, all this, what I described, uh, results in a major silent societal transformation, and it destroys the foundations of a society. And that has been expressed very nicely by Karl Popper. Um, Karl Popper has written a two-volume book, a large one, The Open Society and Its Enemies, very worthwhile reading. And um, 
that is uh, in, in 45 where he has uh, written that. And it's so valid for today, I guess. And he says the abandonment of the rationalist attitude of the respect for reason and argument and the other fellow's point of view, the stress upon the deeper layers, he means emotional layers, of human nature, all this must lead to the view that thought is merely a somewhat superficial manifestation of what lies within these irrational depths. Marvelously said. And he said, it must nearly always, I believe, produce an attitude which considers the person of the thinker instead of his thoughts. And that's exactly what you see today. If someone in public says something which the mainstream or some people don't like, then they don't discuss the opinion that this guy was telling us. They discuss whether he has the wrong friends or becomes applause from the wrong side or whatever there is. And so the content of the message is just wiped away by an emotional stirring about how immoral, for example, this person is. And the important conclusion he comes to, it, it must produce the belief that we think with our blood or with our national heritage or with our class. And once we have done this, we have abundant um, rational, uh, rationalist attitude, political equalitarianism becomes practically impossible. So what does it mean? It means that abandoning rational arguments opens the path for fascism, nationalism, and communism. At another, um, um, at an, in another part he says they drink from the same source. There's another philosopher I like very much, Robert Spemann. He died in 2018. And um, he wrote about uh, the revolt against truth. So the revolt against reason by Popper and the revolt against truth, is that that's, these are my words now, by Robert Spemann. And he says, whoever denies reason, reason's capacity for truth, whoever denies the validity of the principle of contradiction can no longer say anything at all. Indeed, in the thesis that there is no truth, um, in the, sorry, in the treatise that uh, uh, there, uh, there is no truth presupposes truth, at least for this thesis. So if I make the statement that there is no truth, then there has to be the truth that there is no truth. Otherwise, we'll end up in the absurd. So Nietzsche has taken that up and said, he starts with the objection to this. And he said, who says that we don't live in the absurd? We may be getting ourselves into contradiction, but that's the way it is. Reason's despair of itself cannot be articulated again in a logical, consistent way. We must learn to live without truth. So you can make your own decision whether you want to live without or with truth, but the statement or the conclusion is life without truth is absurd. So this leads us to sort of a highway, downhill road, a highway to hell. The Vogue culture is a successor of neo-Marxism. It's only tolerant towards views with its own narrow spectrum. It's intolerant against unwanted views. And that has been said quite a while ago, in 65, by Herbert Marcuse, one of the proponents of the Frankfurt School. He said, liberating tolerance would therefore mean intolerance towards movements from the right and tolerance towards movement from the left. As far as the scope of this tolerance and intolerance is concerned, it should extend to the level of action as well to that of discussion and propaganda, to words and deeds. And what is proper left and what is right is of course decided by Herbert Marcuse. So if you find yourself in a view that is not classified within this spectrum, then you should have no right to say anything or to, uh, uh, to express your statement in public. It is tyranny disguised as liberation. It creates a mental monoculture. It narrows down solutions to the one unavoidable measure. It abuses good concepts because justice, equality, diversity are good concepts. 
but used in this neo-Marxist way, it abolishes the stability of a society. It creates malfunctioning institutions because the institutions run after ideology and not after truth. And it leads not only to inferior or wrong, but also sometimes to dangerous decisions. It cannot be overcome by arguments because the ideology is always right. It can only be overcome by damage and great suffering. If truth becomes irrelevant, then trust disappears. Is there any reason why we should assume that there are no conspirations, for example, that politics works for the common good, that the government can be trusted? How can we believe that when trust disappears, why truth has disappeared? Scientific, scientific institutions, can they be trusted? Can fact checkers are, be reliable? If all these questions are in doubt, then trust is lost and the society fragments. Everybody believes what he wants to believe or she wants to believe. And why is the fight against truth so hard? And again, there's a spiritual reason behind that. The quote from John 8 is a bit longer. The devil was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he's a liar and the father of lies. So the more we depart from a, a, a Christian grounding, the more lies and so on uh, get power. And the more we depart from Christian roots, the worse the situation gets. So the result is a shattered society. Life without truth is absurd. Some people would say that. Every human desires something to rely on, nearly everyone. And the way out is everybody makes his own or her own truth. And truth is a prerequisite and not an obstacle for unity, as well as for democracy, as Papa said in the beginning. If there is no truth, what can we say? If there is no truth, then there is no basis at all to finding any common ground. Because how should we come to some conclusion, to some conclusion that we agree on, or, or even that we know that we disagree on? There is no basis for human rights. The majority can always vote to oppress or even extinguish an unwanted minority because it's democracy. So we can make a 51 to 49 percent decision, that's it. So the consequence, a fragmented society. Okay, after having said all that, um, I don't want to leave you depressed. Um, let's look at Christians, and my thesis is Christians are friends of freedom and unity. And uh, the part I want to begin with is a famous statement, at least in, in German uh, philosophy of politics, um, the dilemma of the liberal secularized state. And um, in the preamble of the German basic law or basic constitution, you could say, there is a statement saying, Conscious of its responsibility for, before God and people, the German people have given themselves this basic law. Marvelous. The German constitution is just such a marvelous construction. It kept our society healthy for decades. It was really a great achievement. And it was a great achievement that it started with this preamble. Now the problem is, um, it is a pre-political basis of German society. And um, Ernst Wolf, Wolfgang Böckenförde, and uh, the sentence is called the Böckenförde Dictum, says um, the liberal secularized states, state lives on conditions that it cannot guarantee itself. So what does it mean? So there is a liberal secularized state. It does not have uh, a one world view, but it leaves uh, the situation open for its citizens to have whatever world view they want to have. But the condition for a functioning society is that people accept uh, that uh, lying, murder, um, robbing, uh, whatever, um, is not good. So if no one in society would accept these basic rules which come from Christianity, um, then you could have as much police as you, as, as you want. You, wouldn't just, you couldn't run the society, it just wouldn't work. 
So the liberal secular state cannot expect a conviction or a certain conviction um, or worldview from its citizens, but it needs certain convictions among its citizens to be able to function. So the conviction that, convictions that stabilized Western society were rooted in Christianity. So take Christianity out and stability will drain out. Now, what is the relation of Christians and government? A big topic. And most people would uh, think about Romans 13. Let everyone be subject to the government authorities, for there is no authority except for that God has established. And the authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against God, what God has instituted, and those who will do so bring judgment on themselves. Therefore, it's necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of consciousness. That's very important. So we don't even steal if no one looks at it. So that, uh, that leads to a certain naivety of Christians. Uh, we do not get involved in politics personally. Politics is a dirty business, so let's just keep out of that. And the government works for our good, which is obvious that it's not always happening. And if at all involved, we pray for politicians. That's fine, so that's good, but that shouldn't be all. And the contradiction is that many Christians behave as if they live in a monarchy rather than a democracy. A democracy calls people to be involved, and Christians should be involved in society. So although there are many Christians, e.g., for example, in the German parliament, I think also in many others, they don't seem to set the agenda. The agenda setting mainly comes from left-wing or anti-Christian or utilitarian or just opportunistically minded members of parliament or governments or their advisors. So the consequences are the protection and preference of their own groups of interests the disrespect and discrimination of other groups. And um, what we see is um, Christians could make a difference in politics. And um, politics without God is that humans are not anymore seen as a subject created in the image of God, but as an object of one's own interests. So we have certain ideological interests and we push them through because we have the power. If I rely on God. I know that God made men in his image. Men are subjects, and they cannot be treated as objects for one's own interest. And if people are seen as objects, then there is no respect or protection of minorities. Then there is no respect for the freedom of opinion. There is no respect to proper use of science and data, what concerns me very much as a scientist. And there is a huge desire to gain control over all aspects of life, of private property, organizations, schools, universities. There is a tendency of having more and more control and regulations about society, which would not be necessary if one could rely on the subjects which are responsible before a higher order, say, by God. So there is controlling of the internet, there is abolishing Cash, uh, trying to abolish cash as the introduction of permanent electronic identification. And all that is done under the pretense of justice. Sometimes there are good reasons, sometimes you see that the reasons are not really good, but it's all if we want to have a just society, we have to control everything because we have to control that everything is done in a just way. What do we have to do? I'd say first thing is come from conformity to courage. And this is the good news here. I don't know if you've heard of the conformity experiments of Salomon Ash. That was in the 1950s, so a long time ago. What he did was he made psychological tests and he uh, invited test subjects and they were asked to assess the length of lines. So they were asked which line on the right side is have the same length as the line as the one line on the left side. Now the interesting thing is the setting was that there was only one real test person. So there were three or four or five fake test person 
and they were told what to say, and one, the last one, was a real test person. He didn't know that the other one were fake test persons. So the interesting thing is the behavior of the instructed persons. When all instructed persons are instructed to give a wrong answer, then the, proper, the proportion of test persons who gave an obviously wrong answer was 37%. So more than one-third of people were willing, or for whatever reason, gave an obviously wrong answer. Although they were not electroshocked, or they were not punished, or whatever there is, they were, for some reason, under a social pressure or a conformity pressure that made them to give the wrong answer in a very stupid setting that everybody could see was wrong. Now, what happens if one person, one of the instructed person, gave the right answer, then the proportion of test persons who gave the obviously wrong answer dropped to 5%. And that's extremely encouraging. So if you sit in a setting and listen to someone and you say, oh, this is not wrong what the guy tells there, and you ask the question and you question this person, or you are in a group of people and are, you are the only one, the first one, who says, oh, I don't believe that this is correct or shouldn't we look at this and this, then others will join you. And you can break the ice, as we say. You can make the first step, but the, 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 uh, the first step is always to be made by the most courageous person. If the first step is made by someone, then others will follow. So it's, it's a, there's a huge power in the, si in the being silence. And if we break the silence, we can have a manifest uh, aspect on an audience or on, on uh, other settings where people are um, discussing about an opinion. So, raising your voice as an individual can have an enormous impact. So, um, can we think the way we want to think if everybody thinks differently? I want to quote an answer from uh, a philosopher I like very much, Arvin Plantinger, and he has written uh, a paper on uh, advice to Christian philosophers, and uh, not only for Christian philosophers, and he said, so the f Christian philosopher has his own topics and projects to think about, and when he thinks about these topics of current concern, he will think about them in his own way, which may be a different way. He may have to reject certain currently fashionable assumptions, and the Christian philosopher has a perfect right to the point of view and pre-philosophical assumptions he brings to philosophic work. And the fact that these are not widely shared is interesting, but fundamentally irrelevant. So if you are in a discussion or in, uh, in, in a sort of argument and you try to adopt the, uh, the assumptions of the atheist or whoever talks to you and wonder why you don't get to a decent result, it's your own fault. You don't have to adapt these assumptions that the other brings towards you. You have to make your own statements. You have to make your own assumptions and you have to make your own conclusions. If you are trapped in the, uh, in the way of arguing of, um, of non-Christians, then you are lost. You have no chance to come to a good result. And still, um, in many countries, at least in Germany, and I think in, in uh, most other uh, Western countries at least, we have a right of our own in, uh, uh, opinion. So speak with your full right, as long as this right is on your side. Um, in 2019, there was a celebratory speech about religious freedom in Germany from uh, Professor Dr. Heiner Bielefeld, a former UN special representative of freedom of religion. And one sentence stuck out for me of his speech, and he said, it is not the one who exercises fundamental rights who has to justify himself, but whoever restricts fundamental rights. So if someone comes to you and says, you are not allowed to say or to do this, then you don't have to prove that you, that, you have, that you can, but he has to prove that you cannot. A very important point of view. If you need help, consult, for example, uh, Alliance Defending Freedom International. Um, they have lawyers who can help you with sorting out this kind of situation. If worse comes to worse, then we need lawyers. I think the role of, um, uh, of this branch uh, of lawyers is uh, getting more and more important. So, we come to the end. Can we overcome a polarized society? How did Marxism-based ideology succeed? They had a long breath over decades. They went on to influence society. 
They penetrated the institution. Rudi Dutschke said the long march through the institutions. Uh, we have to have uh, patience and work through the institutions. We have to use subversion. Judith Butler's book, Feminism and the Subversion of Identity. And finally, if one has come to the top or has a chance to say something at the top, then we use a top-down approach. For example, the United Nations First World Conference on Women in Beijing implemented gender mainstreaming without anybody knowing what this is. And um, so the summary, for example, of J.D. Hunter in his uh, book, uh, To Change the World, that was recommended as far as I can see in this, um, uh, in this group, uh, says ideas have consequences in history, not because they are inherently truthful or obviously correct, but because the way they are embedded in, a very, in very powerful institutions, networks, interests, and symbols. So it's not enough to just be right. There has to be more. And the most profound changes in culture typically takes place over the course of multiple generations. That's a long breath. They can be seen first as they penetrate into the linguistic and mythic fabric of the social order. That's what we see with language. In doing so, it then penetrates the hierarchy of rewards and privileges, deprivations and punishments that organizes social life. That's what we see in many organizations now. Cultural change of these steps can only be seen and described in retrospective. And that is also what we see. We see that society has changed and what is now believed is an ideology which has become common sense. So what do we need? We need a long breath. We need prophetic insight and creativity. Not only be at the phenomenons that you see today, but ask yourself what are the mechanisms and what will come tomorrow on the day after. A strategic presence in all societal relevant institutions. We have to be, as Christians, in all relevant institutions, in politics, in science, in industry, in wherever. Because if there is one Christian, it changes the situation. And we have to be, that's my part, on the top of the scientific debate so that no one can come and say, oh, science has agreed on this is such and such. There is no the science that has agreed on everything. If you go to any scientific conference, you have 10 professors, you have at least 12 opinions. So there is not the um, the one uh, uh, opinion. We have uh, to shape and create influential networks and institutions. The best would be to have institutions of our own, Christian universities, for example. And we have to be convincing. I think subversion is not a good route for us because subversion works in secret, but we can convince people. And we have to work for unity and vision in churches because many churches are separated entities from the rest of society, and that's not good. Not all, but many. And I also think it would be good to make friends with non-Christians looking for truth because there are so many people I've experienced that in the, net, in the network of uh, scientific of freedom. Some of the people are Christians, but many are not. But there are so many people that look for truth and they look for things that are really decent and for good arguments, and they are fed up with, uh, with all this emotional stuff. There are many, many people out there we can, um, we can relate to. And I think uh, go through every open door there is. God sometimes opens doors or surprises us, and we should be very open. What is the next step? Where can we go? And what has God prepared for us to do? So. Can we overcome a polarized society? Yes, because God is sovereign. But we don't know how far we are on the clock. So God has often done the unprecedented, for example, the German reunification in 1919. I was in Berlin as a PhD student at an excursion, and, in, um, and then the message came, the wall has opened. And I said, this is a joke, isn't it? And people had to see, people had to see the pictures that it really happened. They wouldn't believe it. And the, uh, the former East German government said, uh, we, have, we were prepared for everything, but not for candles and prayers. So sometimes history is very surprising. 
Can we overcome a polarized society? No. God is sovereign. We may be actually entering in, time, in a time of judgment. We don't know how God uses the current challenges which we have. I don't know, everybody knows about these challenges. But still, God is in control, but we don't always have the understanding of how he controls history, but he does. So anyway, we are called to do our job, work for the best of our societies, protect freedom, and help that people become Christians. So if you want to read about all that, what I said, then you can look at the book, or if you can't read German, then you can look at the homepage given here. Anyway, I hope this gives you some very interesting things to think about, and I thank you very much for your listening.